Home field advantage for LSU is perfumed by good food and permeated by good vibes. Life is great at 8-2 as the number seven team in the country led by Coach O. ESPN College Football tonight is presented by Dr. Pepper. LSU plays host to 1-10 and 10 Rice out of Conference USA tonight here in Baton Rouge, the final home game of the season for the Tigers. Number seven in the country in the most recent college football playoff rankings. And this week was the first time since the inception of the college football playoff in 2014, the top 10 didn't change. LSU, however, was not satisfied with his result last week, a touchdown win over Arkansas on the road. Welcome here to Baton Rouge. So glad to have you with us. I'm Mike Cousins. He's Kirk Morrison. Thanks for being Win against Arkansas right. last week. They felt like on offense, they stepped off the gas a little right. bit, and tonight they want to go full throttle against Rice. <laughs> yeah, they want to go full throttle because they understand they've still got a shot at the college football playoff, but it all starts with the offense. After a poor October offensively, that's what today's all about versus Rice, is getting back on track similar to what we saw last week versus, versus Arkansas. This is a big game tonight offensively for LSU because if they want to go anywhere this season, it's going to have that offense is definitely going to have to step up. That touchdown for Burrow against Arkansas was his first since late September, and the offense has seen a drop off over the last five games, even though the record holds at a very nice looking eight and two. Ed Ogeron today says it's a bit of a reset button today for this team. The final two weeks of the regular season, tonight against Rice, yes. next week on the road in College Station against Texas A&M, will determine what their postseason fate is. LSU wins the toss today, and keeping in line with what Ed O told us yesterday, they're taking it. <laughs> they want to start on the offensive and let Rice know that they are not going to let them hang around today. So off we go on a relatively chilly evening here tonight in Louisiana. Temperature about 55 degrees to get this evening going. Tigers 5-2 in the SEC. It's a long-standing series with Rice. Joe Burrow hasn't been a part of it, but he has been a part of the lore of LSU this year. Seven touchdowns for him, four interceptions. And whether it's through the air or on the ground today, however this offense succeeds, he'll be happy if they do. Yeah, he's going to be able to use his legs. He's been able to throw the football at times. But this offense looked a little stagnant over the last couple weeks. This is a game for them to get right back on track like we saw earlier in the football season. Burrow takes Lloyd Cushenberry's snap and sends it out to the perimeter for Derek Dillon, who's got the catch out across the 30. You know, looking at LSU offensively, they got to be peachy. I mean, to get back to what they did in the Georgia game, which is throwing the football, running as well. Rhythm and blues, up-tempo, timing like you see right now. They're getting that rhythm, up-tempo. It's where this offense is best. Passing complete in and out of the hands of Justin Jefferson, Burroughs' top target, who comes off of a career-high 117 yards on six catches against the Razorbacks last week. And if you're Rice defensively, the key is bring an extra chin strap. They want to get physical up front. LSU's offensive line, they want to run the ball. And look, defensively, put it on Burrow if you're Rice. Make Burrow beat you today. He goes against a beleaguered defense today. It's Foster Moreau, the tight end with the catch. The Owls of Rice allow 38 points a game. That's 117th in the country and almost 440 yards of offense. Good for 101st in FBS. It's a first down run for Nick Brosette on his senior night. The native of Baton Rouge with a first down run. You gotta have a lot of confidence if third and five, you go with the run play, but that's where offensive line play comes in here. Just out front, guys in front getting on blocks, and Brosette finding a way. 13 yards on the pickup, the heave downfield, incomplete going for Jefferson. Two looks his way and two incomplete passes. Yeah, Jefferson's pointing at his quarterback, let him know, hey, my bad, my bad. That ball is on the money. That ball is thrown in the bucket. I've seen Justin Jefferson make that play all year long in that one. I could say he lost it in the lights, but that one he knows he missed a golden opportunity 
But that's what the offense needs. Joe Burrow throwing the ball downfield. Just a missed opportunity there by Justin Jefferson. Brings up second and ten. Middle was shut down for Brosset, so he kicks it to the outside and gets pushed in the back going out of bounds by Colin Whitaker, the cornerback for Rice. Redshirt sophomore Whitaker, part of a very young defense, a very young team overall this year for the Owls. Of the 19 players they signed coming into their freshman class, graduates of high school this past May or June, 14 of those 19 have seen the field this year. They ran it last time on third and five, on third and four, plenty of time, and a reaching grab by Terrace Marshall Jr. First down on the doorstep of the 25 of Rice. Yeah, you talked about freshmen over on the right side. Well, what about this terrific freshman, Terrace Marshall, for LSU? He runs a nice little square in, five yard in, and his quarterback hits him right between the numbers. First down, you mentioned it. They ran the ball earlier on third down, this time the pass, and that's a rhythm pass for Joe Burrow. That's where I think he's at its best. When he's in rhythm, sets his feet, and throws, that's Burrow for you. Brosette off the left side, looked like he had nothing, and Stutter stepped his way into a nice pickup there. Nice little opening drive here by LSU. We mentioned the missed opportunity on the pass to Jefferson, but once you get down here in the red zone, I'm a big Foster Moreau fan. When you look at this offense, obviously we know it's about running the football, but usually the tight end, Foster Moreau, some big catches down here in the red zone. No Jefferson on the field for the last couple of snaps. Brosette inside the 20, and he's tripped up around the 15-yard line. He really doesn't look like he's picked up a full head of steam just yet, just trying to read the defense. Treshawn Chamberlain, the freshman linebacker, stopped him. Being able to change the pace of which you run, that's what Brosette's able to do. He goes from 0 to 60 very quickly. If he puts a foot in the ground, he can take off on you. There goes Burrow. Pushed backwards at the five-yard line as the Tigers switched it up at running back with Edwards Elair faking it to the right. Burrow keeps it to the left. A positive play. Now they go with tempo. They get the defense on its heels. They go right back to the ball. Edwards Elair tries taking it through the middle. Anthony Ekpe, the team's sack leader, got him. And now first and goal. Extra effort and a touchdown. Clyde Edwards Elair has the game's first score. You ever seen the, the old high knee drill when you warm up, when you're doing exercises? That's the old high knee drill right there by Edwards Elair. Just keeping those knees going high, jumping his way into the end zone. LSU making it look easy on that first drive. Senior night for Cole Tracy, too. One of the best kickers in the country. A transfer from a Sumson College makes it 7-0. LSU takes almost four minutes off the clock on its opening drive of seven zip over Rice. Welcome back to Death Valley, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the SEC on ESPN. Opening drive and a strong one for LSU, punched in by Clyde Edwards Elair, the running back, to make it seven nothing Tigers as they get set to kick it away to the Rice Owls who come in 1 and 10 0 oh and 7 in Conference USA. Here's been one of the unsung stars of LSU this year. Avery Atkins the freshman from Auburn Alabama 
He's had a touchback on 90% of his kickoffs this year. It's a new school record for him. And that number only continues to grow. So Rice will start first and 10 from the 25 yard line. Here to open things up down a touchdown. Gowell's coming off a 28-13 loss to Louisiana Tech. Led at least for now, we expect to see several <laughs> quarterbacks tonight. It's the grad transfer from Vanderbilt, Sean Stankavich. Yeah, it's almost uh, <laughs> trying to figure out who is going to be the quarterback. You get a little tense moment there for a second because five different guys for Rice can take a, take a snap from center at some point tonight. First down handoff to Aston Walter, the soft, the senior from Crosby, Texas, gains a couple. You know, my keys to the game, really, just walk a straight line if you're Rice. I mean, look, no steps off. Stay on the straight line. And when I say take a number, that means be patient. Take a number like you're at the deli and just wait. Be patient within the offense. And if you're LSU defensively, who's that QB? Locate the QB who's in the game and finish. Triple zeros on the clock. LSU's defense, poor job last week versus Arkansas. This week, got to finish. Expect to see a heavy dose of Walter tonight. He and his twin brother, Austin Walter, both see time in the backfield. Part of what has hurt Rice this year has been being hurt at quarterback. You mentioned five different quarterbacks have taken a snap for them. Seven different players have taken a snap, including some wildcat <laughs> formations. And Stan Cabbage, they thought he was out for the year with an ankle injury, but he returned last week after missing three games. Parker Towns now in at quarterback here on third down. Uh, he was ready to throw, but LSU was ready for a lot more than that. He goes down under the pressure of Glenn Logan. And Ed Alexander was the first one into the backfield. It's all about locating the quarterback. And they knew that Parker Towns comes into the game and what he likes, LSU defense audibles, and that defensive line gets after it. That's a coverage sack by LSU's defense, allowing that defensive line, that pressure to get to Towns. One of the stars for the Owls this year has been Jack Fox, their punter. One of 10 semifinalists for the Ray Guy Award, best punter in the country. Averaging 46 yards a kick. He sends this one all the way back inside the 15. And potential for a big return all the way out to the 30. Jonathan Giles on the return for LSU. 15 yards after a nearly 60 yard kick from Fox. ESPN College Football is presented by Ice Cold Dr. Pepper, the official drink of Fansville, and in part by McDonald's. One drive apiece for LSU and Rice, and it's 7-0 Tigers with a touchdown on their opening drive as they look to impose dominance. Over a team with the longest losing streak in the country right now, Rice, which hasn't won against an FBS opponent since the beginning of last season. The offense since that Georgia game has taken a bit of a hit for LSU. So the key today for Ed Ogeron and company was to get back their identity and reestablish exactly what it is that they think they do best. Start with the run game. That Rice says out. they've got control of the ball. The officials are trying to peel away the pile. And it belongs to the Owls inside LSU territory. Not Dan Rice. It's Dylan Silcox, number eight. He comes in with a nice hit. The red shirt sophomore. He actually started last week's game for Antonio Montero, the fresh, true freshman. And this time, Dylan Silcock just comes in. He rips that football out of John, che John Trey Kirkland's hand. LSU trying a little bit of a different offensive approach. Kirkland gets the direct snap. And he goes on tackle. On the field, a fumble is under further review. 
They're going to take another look at this one. So let's look at some of the elements of what happened. The one thing I did see was that blur of Dylan Silcox, number eight, just come through. Just watch number eight come through. He gets Kirkland and boom, right across. And it looks he tries to get that football out. Now, is the football moving before Kirkland hits the ground? The officials would need indisputable video evidence to overturn the call on the field, granting possession to Rice. The ball is certainly loose yeah. before he comes down, and whether a knee or an elbow hits the ground. Yeah, I think that ball's coming out. That looks like that ball. After further moving. review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. First down, Rice. And Prudy Calderon, the freshman safety, who's been an interception machine as of late, three picks in the last two games, including two last week against Louisiana Tech, which gave LSU a run for its money earlier this season here in Death Valley. Calderon falls on top of that fumble, making a happy Mike Bloomgren, the former Stanford offensive coordinator, now in his first season as head coach for Rice. Ball is tipped and incomplete. Devin White got his eyes on it just a little bit too late. The linebacker nearly had the interception after it was tipped by Richard Lawrence. Good job by Lawrence, just pushing up, getting the hand up. But you know, going back to defensively for Rice, that they know they have to create turnovers, get the ball back to their offense. This is a young group, offensively and defensively. So the confidence of being here in Death Valley starts to grow when you start to make plays. Aston Walter, no gain, third and ten. And when it comes to confidence for Rice. One of the motivational tactics that Mike Bloomgren used this week was showing his team the scoreboard from when Louisiana Tech was here earlier this year. They went down 24-0, ultimately made it a game at 24-21 with three straight unanswered scores. Didn't come away a victor, but as a heavy underdog, still gave LSU a scare early in the season. Yeah, that was a game me and you did, partner. It was came down to the end. You like that call to run it when they haven't had success on third and ten? We're going to start putting the ball in the air, and I know that that rush has got to you so far for Pure Rice offensively, but you got to continue to throw the football. I know they want to shorten the game up. They want to run the football, but to me, everything has to be almost four down territory. I'm just, it, this is almost like my bowl game, and I know Coach Bloomgren doesn't want to talk about it like that, but hey, you're sitting here one and ten. You got to find a way to go out and score touchdowns. Field goals against LSU is just not going to work. But you always got to be alert for a fake in these situations. Tries from 52 for Fox. The high school quarterback kicks it away, gets a ton of leg into it, and it's no good. Just 5 for 12 on field goal tries this year for Fox. Rice still scoreless. Welcome back to ESPN College Football presented tonight by Dr. Pepper. Mike Cousins and Kirk Morrison, so glad you're joining us here tonight for LSU and Rice under first-year head coach Mike Bloomgren, native of Tallahassee, was a GA at Alabama. The last time he said he came to Tiger Stadium was in 2000. Mm. Intimidating venue, sixth largest in all of college football. Hoping his team's not intimidated today. Just missed a 52-yard field goal. So it's back to LSU. Burrow tomorrow, who's got almost 20 yards there on first down. You almost wish you could have been able to see that connection for many years. But Burrow to Moreau has only been for one year. Obviously, we know Joe Burrow, the transfer from Ohio State. But Foster Moreau really, to me, evolved within this offense. And I think had these guys been able to hook up for two or three years, that connection definitely down here on that side of the 50-yard line could have been a lethal connection. Rice showing blitz. Gives a big open lane for Brosset. He's got about nine and a half yards churning his way toward the sticks. Already in the first quarter, he's taken himself over the 800-yard mark for the year. Yeah, but Bro said you got to have good blocking up front and the left guard, Garrett Brumfield. He's a senior as well, playing his last game here at LSU, here in Death Valley. He's out here blocking 
for Brosette. Up play action. Pocket holds up. Deep throw into single coverage. Touchdown, LSU. Stephon Sullivan goes up to get it on a 38-yard toss from Burrow. You know, the first pass earlier to Jefferson, it was dropped. That time, Burrow just throws it up. And Stephon Sullivan, he just goes up and gets it. I mean, that's great coverage by Trashad Chamberlain. The, I'm sorry, by Colin Whitaker, the true, like the, the red shirt sophomore, but Sullivan just climbs the ladder and just got off on a different floor. Well, the measuring stick for the LSU staff today was whether they could play today with the same vigor that they started the season with rattling off those wins against top 10 teams. So far, so good. Up two scores on Rice. The junior Stephon Sullivan with the grab from 38 yards out. His second touchdown catch of the year makes it 14-0 LSU. 5.52 left in the opening quarter. Is that usually how it happens? The underclassmen usually step up and make the big plays on senior night. We talked about Brosset and Foster Moreau, but already a couple of underclassmen already scoring touchdowns. You got to have the run game to set up the pass game, and so far that's been the case. As Rice offensively has run six plays, a total of two yards, and LSU has 13 plays, each longer than two yards. The total output for the outs. You got to settle in here. It's the third drive of the game, and if you're Rice, just settle in, take a deep breath. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Take a number. Be patient. Things are going to happen. Don't try to force the issue. Stay within the offense, but at some point, you have to start getting the ball down the field. They get down the field just in the wrong direction on that play. Neil Farrell Jr. gets the sack on Stan Kavich. It's about di discipline, and that's what Dave Aran, the defensive coordinator, he preaches. Guys, just do your job. And Farrell, this is a sophomore, shaking his stuff early. Not like a Polaroid picture, though. No, not like the Polaroid <laughs> picture, but he's out there shaking it early. Loss of four makes it second and 14. They're really trying to emphasize the running game with Aston Walter. Had his best week last week against Louisiana Tech. 72 yards on 17 carries, but tell you what, competition level's a little bit different this week. Yeah, it's a little bit different, but think about this though, Mike. You get to third and long now. You don't want to be in these situations, and now, Third and 14, there's not a lot of plays in the playbook for third and 14, especially against this defense. These guys at LSU, they love these situations. They let the down four go out and attack, and they tend to drop four to five to six different guys underneath. Play man under and keep a safety over the top. Tigers rush four to throw from Stan Cavish to the 40-yard line. His leading receiver, Austin Trammell, who grew up here in Baton Rouge till about age nine, gets it for 17 yards. Oh, I love the over route. Watch Trammell. He just goes all the way across the field. You need timing. You need blocking up front to allow this route to develop. But Stan Cabbage, a nice throw, delivering for the first down to Trammell. Their big run for Walter. He was a wide receiver, then a cornerback, then went to running back last year, but got hurt early in the season. And now he feels like he's found his niche in the backfield. Says only his only regret is that he wished he'd gone to running back sooner. Yeah, that usually happens, especially when you come to 
the Division I level, FBS level, you go in and say, this is who I am, this is who I am, and you realize, I just want to play. Where could I play at? And running back seems to be the place for Walter. Top throw from Parker Towns at quarterback falls incomplete. You, know, you mentioned having to throw the ball on third and long, third and 14 with that completion to Trammell to keep the drive alive. Part of the danger, too, when you know the pressure will be coming quickly, is how good the secondary is. 16 interceptions leads the SEC and is second in the country coming into the weekend only against Maryland, 17. Now you get to third down, and the guy who I tend to look at is number 40, Devin White. He's lined up at the top of the screen. He comes on the butts. Pocket collapses. Stan Cavage runs backwards and has nowhere to go. Taken down back at the 32-yard line by Jacob Phillips. The underclassmen today are reigning supreme so far for LSU. Sophomore with a touchdown catch, and Phillips, the sophomore, finishes that third down. Well, the one thing when I think about LSU defensively, and this is what Coach Bloomgren said as well, there's just speed. And Stan Cabbage can outrun some of those guys on Conference USA. But you get to the SEC, you're not outrunning. And that's Jacob Phillips, a linebacker, 6'4", 229, running like a defensive back. First punt for Fox went for 58. And it's Giles back deep again. Out of bounds, 21 yard line. Well, let's take a look back now with our Jared Drive recap after that 43 yard punt. It just throws. It starts with Foster Moreau. And then it's the run game. It's percent. Perseverance. And then when you got the running game going, take shots at the end zone. Sullivan with the touchdown, but this is what we envisioned the LSU offense to look like pretty much all year long. And we saw that. We saw that in the month of September, but then it went away in October. And they're trying to rekindle that magic as they get to this last part of the season. Well, there was certainly some disappointment over at least the passing game prior to that touchdown pass against Arkansas to Justin Jefferson, where Burrow had gone 131 pass attempts without throwing a touchdown. Still, coming into this game, the Tigers had more wins, eight, than Burrow touchdown passes, seven. Yeah, that month of October, they just want to get away, especially that game against Alabama. That wasn't fun, especially that goose egg that they couldn't get off the scoreboard. They tried, but that defense was too stiff. But, but now they know what's in front of them, but this is the day in which they can try to get this offense, especially the aerial attack, back on track. Morrow with the catch over the middle, slips a tackle. He's got another first down, a popular target today. Came in with just 11 catches. That one goes for 17. And you mentioned Alabama, Kirk. And of course, everybody watching college football today saw they had a little bit of a scare. A lot of teams, including LSU, probably wondering how they didn't put up 17 points. And the <laughs> Citadel did as they scored more points than Arkansas State, Ole Miss, LSU, and Mississippi State combined against the tie. Closing in now in the final minute of the opening quarter as Chamberlain makes the tackle. Remember, you can stream college football all season long. We're down to the final week of the regular season next weekend. Everything available on ESPN+. Plus. You can start your free trial by downloading the ESPN app. And tripped up from behind as he started to scramble. You know, shy of midfield. I think that's an underrated part of his game, by the way, with Joe Burrow. That may be the last play of the quarter, by the way. But the underrated part for Joe Burrow is that he had an out route, but he saw that Rice had covered. 
had it covered. And what does he do? He doesn't try to force and go through the progressions. He realizes his first two options aren't there. Tuck the football, get positive yards, and now you got a nice End of the first quarter. Rather than trying to force it, could have been an interception or a turnover. His vision, his foresight, one of the things that separates him from Miles Brennan, the sophomore who we may see later today. But at 14 nothing, after one quarter of play, LSU has the lead, the number seven team in the country. It's still first teamers time in Baton Rouge. Welcome back to the SEC on ESPN. We go to the second quarter, a two touchdown advantage for number seven LSU, looking to hold steady before the final week of the regular season next week against Texas A&M. Third straight week that the Tigers have had the same starting five along the offensive line for what has been a rotating cast of characters this year, whether due to suspension or injury, but it's bringing them consistency up front. Yeah, a little bit of musical chairs, and look, last week, they felt that they didn't protect well enough versus Arkansas. Definitely want to correct some of those issues they had up front a week ago. On third and two, Brosette moving laterally, but he's got enough by a hair to get the Tigers a first down. Yeah, he just leaned on that offensive line. That's what LSU, that's what they're known for, the big guys up front, and just watch the push. Hat on hat, continue to get push. First down. Quickly back to it, a gain of about three for the senior from Baton Rouge on the ground. The Rice coaching staff, one of their biggest concerns, just the sheer size and athleticism that they go up against today, knowing that, hey, these players, they had more stars next to their names coming out of high school. That's not what we're worried about. It's just the physicality with which they play. Terrace Marshall's got another catch, freshman. From here in Louisiana, picks up 16 Tiger yards. That's his second five-yard square in. That's kind of been his play of the day so far. That's Joe Burrow's best throw, that five-yard in. Burrow across the middle, another first down to Giles. And we've got a whistle with an injured Owls player down just on the doorstep of the red zone. Gives us a second, second to go to the studio and check in with Chris Cotter. Certainly big news around these parts with former LSU head coach Les Miles reportedly going to sign a deal to become the new head coach at Kansas and try and get them back on track because they haven't had a winning season or reached a bowl game since 2008, which was their second to last season under Mark Mangino. And how about that? We've got the ACC championship game set up. Pitt and Clemson for the ACC title at the start of December. Army defeats Colgate. Look at that. It's a nice little back-to-back -back nine win seasons for Army. But LSU, oh man, thinking about Les Miles. I know a lot of people here know that name and what he was able to do here as a head coach. Always go down in the history books when you bring a national championship to a school. You know, it wasn't so surprising that he's going back into coaching, right. perhaps as much as where he's going back in. Of course, relationship there with the relatively new athletic director, Jeff Long, formerly of Arkansas. They have connections going back to their time at Michigan, but also how much money he left on the table from LSU. Spurrow to throw, looking toward the right side, flicks it to the end zone. That'll be pass interference against Rice. Colin Whitaker has had a tough night. The touchdown throws, or at least the balls to the end zone, have come his way. Yeah, you just see panic there. Was in great position, but panicked, and that's where the hand fighting started. And not being able to look back for the football, that's where Colin Pass Whitaker interference, number 13 defense. Penalty, take the ball to the two-yard line. First down. First of all, nice throw by the quarterback. First, Burrow puts it right where it needs to be. 
Anderson could have got underneath that, but looks like Whitaker, Whitaker hopping off the field there. You know, the contact there in the end zone wasn't too distant from what officials are looking for in college basketball. Now the hook and hold on <laughs> rebounds where the guys get their arms linked up and one guy pulls the other one to the ground. It's good old hand fighting. We like to see it as a defensive player. Brosette dotting the eye. He stretches goal line. He's got six. I asked Coach Ogeron, just give me one word to describe Nick Brosette. And he just told me perseverance. And if that wasn't a perseverance type of run there, where he looked to be denied at the line of scrimmage, but persevered his way through to the end zone. Outstanding job by Brosette, the senior, getting a touchdown on senior night. Tracy remains perfect on the year, 30 for 30. On points after touchdowns, 21 nothing LSU. Sometimes life is about waiting your turn. Perseverance, whether it's the players in front of you or just waiting till you get to the goal line, Nick Brosette embodying that for the Tigers on his senior night. The Tigers say goodbye to 18 seniors tonight. Nick Brosette is one of them, a guy who's waited his turn. He added on their last touchdown to cap off the drive and make it 21 nothing in favor of LSU. A heavy favorite today by about six touchdowns against Rice, which is one and 10. It's only victory this year against Prairie View A&M in their opener. They only scored four touchdowns the entire month of October. And they take over here a couple minutes into the second quarter. It's been tough sledding when they've tried to throw tonight. Yeah, offensively, they're going to have to find a way to get some rhythm because they can't hold up. The offensive line just can't. Against this defensive line, the pressure has been there. It's been Farrell, and then you see Phillips with the speed. This, you're going to have to find some rhythmic throws if you're Rice, if you want to find anywhere to throw against this LSU defense. They're tough. They're stout. One of the best defenses I, I love watching on tape because everybody jumps out at each level. Defensive line, linebackers, and especially that secondary. You saw so far the number of yards allowed per game by LSU this year, almost at 350, which puts them beyond 30th in the country. That's actually a step down from what Dave Aranda has set the standard at the last couple of years. In his first two seasons, the defenses have been fifth overall and 12th overall in yardage allowed. They are 12th overall in scoring allowed, though, just under 17 points a game. Dan Cavage nearly fooled everybody, but didn't fool Devin White, who, although it's senior day, may be very likely playing his last home game here at Baton Rouge. Yeah, watching him down during warm-ups today, like, this guy's everything. And Coach Aranda putting him through drills. And he, there's just certain players in college football, when you see him up close in person, he just looks different. Like, that guy looks like he belongs on the next level. And the way that Devin White's played all season long, Probably going to hear his name called fairly early in next year's NFL draft. Again, just a four man rush, and the throw is short of the sticks, complete to the tight end, Jordan Myers. What is it about Devin White that makes him look different than everybody else? I think number one is just the speed. I mean, he flashes. When you see 40 on tape, you just kind of put a spot circle around him and just watch him go. He's sideline to sideline. But I think what I've seen this year more than anything is his ability to read pressure. When he's coming down, whether he's blitzing the A gap or the B gap, he's able to feel and find a hole. And it's been one of their better defenses. Like on the last play, he finds a way to blitz the quarterback He's got great guys behind him in the secondary that 
you know, definitely benefit from the pressure that he's been able to create. That's one of the new things I've seen him add to his game this season. Fox with a boomer inside the 15 for Giles going backwards. And he's taken down at the 11-yard line. So an 89-yard trip required for the Tigers to extend their 21-0 lead. ESPN College Football, brought to you by Allstate, reminding you that football season is mayhem. A second senior day for Cole Tracy, the grad <laughs> transfer kicker, one of 18 Tigers seniors honored before the game here tonight. Nick Brosette has already gotten off to a great start running the ball, 11 rushes for 60 yards and a score. A guy who's waited his turn for the spotlight finally to illuminate him. Yeah, it's not many running backs in college football that could say I had to wait behind Leonard Fournette and Darius Geis before I got my opportunity. Burroughs throw incomplete for Jamar Chase. A couple of easy throws that have hit the ground tonight. So Brosette having to say goodbye for the final time on this field. Certainly there will be postseason play. Of course, the final couple weeks determine where for LSU. But Coach O said, it's so great to see the parents yeah. out on the field and say, I'm delivering your son back to you. He <laughs> arrived as a boy. He leaves as a man. A lot of tears, but Ed Ogeron said, not from him, not a crier. Catch a first down and then some for Sullivan. Twenty yards for number ten. Yeah, nice throw by Burrow. Steps up in the pocket, eyes downfield, and just waits and waits. And Sullivan finds the hole in the defense. Uh, he's Mr. 58 tonight. Two catches, 58 yards. And now tack on to that total, a third catch. It's worked twice, why not go back to him? He's got a nice little matchup over there. And remember, we saw a little bit earlier, Colin Whitaker, the corner, go off for Rice, and now they've been to his side again. Brandon Douglas Dotson taking over for Whitaker. What's it gotta be like on the Rice defensive side right now, where not only are you the physically inferior team in size and speed, but also you're getting rammed right back to the line where LSU is going play, snap, play, snap. It's a very patient Edwards Elair for the first down. Well, remember, if you're Rice defensively, it's still about the guy in front of you, and that's what Brian White, the defensive coordinator, just kept preaching to his guy. I mean, Brian Smith, I'm sorry. Defensive coordinator kept preaching to his guys. We just got to beat the guy in front of us. That's how we're going to be able to get back in this game. Burrow unloads at the corner incomplete. <laughs> Sullivan so far has been the guy. And this time Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow just misses him. I don't know how you miss a guy who's six foot seven, 232 pounds. You got to miss him. He dropped that. <laughs> that's on the receiver, Kirk. That was right in his hands. Oh, man. That's receivers not helping out Joe Burrow. Burrow's 10 for 14, and all four of the incomplete passes been drops, have yeah. been off the hands. Yeah, been drops. He could be a perfect 14 for 14. They designed the run for him. Great block in front from the tight end, Morrow. You know, Joe Burrow's a lot, a lot bigger than you think. You see him 6'4", 216 pounds, and we always talk about prototypical quarterbacks. 6'4 is really the height, but the 216 pounds, he can really move, and he's a guy that understands where he's at on the field, gets out of bounds, doesn't take the big hit. Wide open hole there for Edwards Elair. Finally stopped by the freshman linebacker, Antonio Montero. And they're right back into tempo. This is the LSU offense we saw from September. This is what they like to do. Dominance on the offensive front for the Tigers. They've picked up 17 first downs 
compared to just one for the Owls. Burrow to the outside. The blocking doesn't come around for Derek Dillon. Twenty-one nothing LSU, number seven team in the country, as they give Rice a chance for a breather here with a huddle. Started out as number 25 in the AP poll in the college football playoff rankings. They went from number three, preceding their matchup with top-ranked Alabama, and now here to number seven, looking to hold steady this week before taking on Texas A&M in the season finale. Blitz up the middle, the throw over the middle. Tomorrow, the tight end for the touchdown. It's about matchups, or it's just about who doesn't cover their man. And Foster Moreau, the tight end, I mentioned it earlier, down there near the red zone. Got to keep an eye on number 18, and no one from Rice cover him, and that's just an easy pitch, catch, touchdown Tigers. His first touchdown catch of the season. 28-0 LSU with 8.01. Left before halftime. That's the best night to do it, right? Senior night. That's it. Get your first one of the season. But man, I'm telling you, Foster Moreau, outstanding tight end. Kirk, big week in the NFL this week. Chiefs and Rams Woo! certainly deserves attention. Yes, indeed. Don't overlook Vikings Bears, though. I think that's a really big <laughs> matchup. NFC North, first place on the line. I didn't check the injury wire today. Maybe we see Lamar Jackson. Getting his first start for the Ravens. We will see tomorrow when that 90 minutes before kickoff. I'm always looking for the inactives in the NFL. But maybe he gets that opportunity, Lamar Jackson. And Monday night, perhaps one of the higher scoring games in recent memory we'll see yes. in the NFL. You I will be there. I can't wait. <laughs> Stars on display. Yes. Both teams are 9 and 1. And this is the future of the NFL. Yes. 23 years old, 24 years old, Mahomes and Goff, two of the best right now. You got Mahomes and Goff. You've got Tyreek Hill versus Brandon Cooks. You've got Kareem Hunt versus Todd Gurley. You got Andy Reid versus Sean McVay. I mean, the storylines are there. I can't wait for Monday night at the LA Coliseum. It's gonna be a fun one. One of the best games in the NFL we've had in a long time. It's LSU 28 points, Rice 22 yards. So back to work for Stan Cavage and company, the former Vanderbilt signal caller who in four years under Derek Mason in Nashville threw all of one pass. He's battled injuries throughout his football career. Three knee injuries starting back in high school. It comes from great lineage. His dad, Scott, played at quarterback at North Carolina in the 80s and spent time in the NFL with the Broncos and the Dolphins. And what's cool, too, is that his dad wrote a book called The QB Mentor about the journey that he and Sean took about not only how do you help your son become a good athlete, but become a good person and work through adversity and be able to do that. And part of how he ended up here was because of his new head coach, Mike Bloomgren, formerly of Stanford, where Derek Mason was an assistant as well. Mason ran the defense back in 2013 as Bloomgren was concurrently the offensive coordinator. Says, hey, I've got a guy who can play quarterback for you. And that's how the Durham, North Carolina native ended up in Houston this year. His throws incomplete for Myers, the tight end, third and short. Yeah, it's all about connections. The connections throughout the college football journey. And you mentioned head coach Derek Mason and coach Bloomgren being able to know each other and have an opportunity to help out. What's been the biggest thing in college football you've, we've seen over the last couple of years? It, not only did it benefit Rice, but it's also benefited the team on the other side, LSU. Joe Burrow being able to transfer from Ohio State and take over the starting role for the Tigers of LSU. Different look from Rice, but the initial spot appears to be good for a first down. 
with Juma Odo Viano taking the snap. And you could see pre-snap Grant Delpit, one of the safeties, was jumping up and down, signaling <laughs> from the backfield to say, hey, things are a little bit different here with the freshman from Arlington, Texas, getting his 28th carry of the year. Yeah, that was one of my keys to the game is that if you're LSU defensively, you have to know who's at quarterback. And once again, Odo Viano in the wild owl, not the wild cat. That's the signal for the wild owl. So there he goes. A productive run for almost nine. Productive run and a productive drive so far. The true freshman, like you mentioned, out of Arlington. Look, he's a, he's a running back. He's not a quarterback. Takes a direct snap. Good blocking up front and runs through a tackle of Delpit. But he's a big back, though. You know, 5'10", 190 pounds. And look, I think... If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You go back to it as Otaviano again in the wild owl. I always find those formations interesting right. when they do end up going for big gains because the defense knows what's coming. Yeah, sometimes until you get, until you go all in on the blitz or you go all in on the ball carrier and he throws it. <laughs> That's what you never always you can never guess. That's what the thing is. You play true to it. But when the quarterback original quarterback is out of the game and you have a true runner who takes a direct snap, the defense has to play it honest. They have to cover down where there's a real quarterback is in who can throw the ball consistently. It's a different play. Oh, wishbone formation. And off Walter, first down Rice. It's one of the few teams in college football that lists a fullback on its depth chart. And they got loaded up in the backfield. The fullback <laughs> grad transfer from UCLA, Giovanni Gentosi, helping lead the way. That looked like some old SWC, some Southwest Conference football back in the day, Mike. A little too young for you probably to understand, but... That was some old wishbone football. No, but you just tugged at the heartstrings of many <laughs> Texans with that reference. Yes, a little SWC action over there. And again, a different ball carrier or a different quarterback taking the snap again, Odoviano. He gives it up on the toss. Michael Divinity Jr. sitting right on top of it. And nowhere to go for D'Angelo Ellis. But Jerry Mack, the first-year offensive coordinator, feeling like he's found something that has worked, at least on this drive. Former head coach at NC Central before coming to work with his buddy Mike Bloomgren. Yeah, but there was one guy he didn't fool, and that was Michael Divinity. Been waiting to call his name this whole game, number 45. Look, Devin White and Greedy Williams, they're the headliners of the LSU defense. But there's been some other outstanding performers, and Michael Divinity left outside linebacker making a play on that last one. Lob down the sideline, a grab to get it. D'Angelo Ellis, the junior from Houston, going up top 26 for the Owls. You don't think he's excited about that one, Mike? <laughs> the 5'11", 174, and he goes up over Greedy Williams, the possible first round pick next year in the NFL draft. That's an outstanding play. Just going up and grabbing it. Ellis at its highest point. It's an outstanding job. First of all, great throw by Stan Cavage. An outstanding job going up to get the football in Ellis. Odo Viano ready for the snap. Kicks it outside. Divinity says no sir and wrangles him back at the 35. He just keeps showing up. He just continues to show up. And I mentioned it before, number 45 is what makes his defense go. Look, he gets fights through a double team and brings Otto Viano down. You know, Divinity this year, you know, five sacks on the year, nine tackles for loss, interception, force fumble, quarterback hurries. He's been one of the silent assassins on this defense. I said it before, the headlines usually go to Devin White and Greedy Williams, but Michael Divinity, number 45, is having an outstanding season as well. Three receivers set on second and long. The run disrupted in a hurry. Patrick Queen 
the sophomore linebacker. First charge timeout, LSU. Timeout, LSU. Two and a half before the break with Rice on the move. ESPN College Football from Baton Rouge tonight is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. 28-0 LSU as Rice is on the move. A 10-play drive so far. Let's take a look at this week's college football playoff rankings brought to you by Goodyear. First time since the college football playoffs started that the top 10 remained unchanged. Biggest surprise score to you today was what, Kirk? Well, it's going to change next week because I, that Maryland-Ohio State game Ohio State pulling it out in overtime, and Oklahoma State in Stillwater getting the upset over West Virginia. I know LSU fans, they've got to be excited about that one. Definitely put some, uh, some pressure now on Oklahoma. Third down, pass complete to the running back, Austin Walter. He's short of the first down, and there is a flag down on the play. Looks to be on LSU. Yeah, Michael Divinity was yeah. chomping at the bit to get around the corner there. Jumped a couple of times before the snap. Offside, number 45 defense was in the neutral zone at the snap. Penalties five yards from the previous spot. Replay third down. So Divinity excommunicated himself from penalty free play. <laughs> yeah, that time he's just trying to get a beat on the snap. And for me, it's always funny because <laughs> You're looking in at the football, and yet the ball's not snapped, yet you jumped off sides. So I think it was the movement by the center, Shea Baker. And sometimes if you're a defensive player, especially coming off that end sometimes, Mike, you go off first movement. And I think he went off the movement of the center, lifting his head up rather than when the ball being snapped. Crowd as loud as it's been tonight for a third and nine. Just a three-man rush, and it gets there anyway. Pure power pushing through the middle. The redshirt freshman Tyler Shelvin praised for the 60-plus pounds he's dropped since coming on campus, and even then, still powerful, pushing through. Yeah, you called it, Mike. You saw it. Three-man pressure. Got to get rid of the football, Stan Kavich. Two minutes till halftime. My cousins, Kirk Morrison, our entire crew, we're glad you're with us tonight. The number seven team in the country has put on a good performance after letting Arkansas get back into it late last week on the road. Rice so far scoreless. A missed 52 yard field goal earlier from Jack Fox. He's been their long distance field goal kicker. This is Hayden Tobola, the senior from West Texas for the try from 51. Enough distance, and he got it. Rice is on the board, 28-3. He nailed that from downtown. <laughs> That's something to get excited about. Go shake some hands, have some fun on the sideline. That was huge. Points for, for Rice. Yeah, this season, every field goal and extra point made by participating universities. Allstate will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. Thank you, Allstate. So they get three points yeah. out of a long drive. 12 plays, 42 yards. Their most sustained of offensive attack today. They know coming in, this right. is going to be a lopsided final score. The measuring sticks, though, for them are progress in areas to say, hey, did we achieve an objective today? Did we get better at what we wanted to do today for Mike Bloomgren, who's trying to establish a program here? The phrase he uses, intellectual brutality, of right. course, <laughs> from Stanford, from where he's taken that and now trying to bring it to Houston and apply it to Rice. Coming up on our halftime report in the studio with Chris Cotter, the Emmanuel Acho yeah. on Twitter, and Coach Jim Mora. 
take a look at one of the more exciting games today, Ohio State and Maryland. UCF going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, prime time right now on ABC with Cincinnati. Clemson trying to stay unbeaten, taking on Duke. And highlights from around college football's action today. Really intriguing game with UCF and Cincinnati as well. As you mentioned, possible change at the bottom of the top ten for the college football playoff rankings, which will come out next Tuesday night on ESPN. There's a connection out past the 40-yard line for Joe Burrow and Stefan Sullivan. Because if UCF wins, they have yeah. the chance to sneak in, not sneak in, but enter <laughs> the top ten if they can knock off Cincinnati tonight at home and be the first group of five team to get into the top ten of the college football playoff rankings. Already 11 is the highest mark that a group of five team has ever seen. Pass nearly intercepted. Prudy Calderon had his hands on it just shy of midfield. Team leader with four picks, including two goal line interceptions last week against Skip Holtz and the Louisiana Tech Bulldogs. But holding his shoulder as he comes down. Yeah, that's not good. Holding his shoulder, the true freshman from San Marcos High School. And the one thing about Calderon is that you mentioned it. He's been an interception machine this year, too, last week. And then right there, just being able to break on the football, reading Joe Burrow's eyes. Another one of these, can we call them fantastic freshmen for Rice? You know, this world is now built on freshmen. If you're talking about college basketball, you see it here at LSU, and then now at, at Rice, some of these freshmen just watch on him break on the football, almost came up with an outstanding interception, just couldn't corral the football. But that's some of the promise that they're looking at in that secondary led by Calderon, the true freshman. Kirk, you want to talk about freshmen? We've got a flag down, and that ball is intercepted. Brandon Douglas Dotson, the senior, has the pick. There is a flag. It was very early at the line of scrimmage. Offside, number 33 defense. Penalties five yards from the previous spot. Replay second down. Uh, they get Anthony Ekpe. The redshirt sophomore offsides that would have been huge for Rice. So Burrow gets absolved of <laughs> what would have been his fifth interception of the year. And there he is at the bottom of the screen, and he's just lined up offsides. I don't see a definitive look, but you know when you get that close to the ball, you got to look outside at the deep, at the head linesman, the linesman on that side, and make sure just give a look. If he tells you to back up, you do. That was a costly penalty there by Ekpe. LSU holds off all four rushers. Dylan with the catch. So we were talking about freshmen before yes. the interception that wasn't. There was a story that went around the college football newsosphere this week <laughs> about the top player in college basketball through the first few games, Zion Williamson of Duke, the number two player in the ESPN 100 incoming freshman class, that he had been offered a scholarship to LSU <laughs> by a former assistant of Coach O's. So when we met with Ed Ogeron yesterday, we said, hey, did you see this story going around this week? This was big news in a week that didn't carry a huge amount of breaking college football news. And the former assistant had said, I offered the scholarship, but I'm not sure that Coach O actually knew about it. <laughs> not only did he tell us he didn't know about the scholarship offer, he's so dialed in on football, he didn't know who Zion Williamson was. <laughs> but I would imagine, you know, we took a poll just among our room. Yes. How many college football coaches would know who Zion Williamson was? It's probably very few. Very few. And... <laughs> That was my homework for Coach Oda. If you get a little time, Coach, I know you're busy coaching a football team and still trying to get into the college football playoff. But if you can, there's outstanding freshman over at Duke and Zion Williamson. Now, if you had him at LSU on your football team, that's 6'7", 285. You can find somewhere to put him at, off at offensively. The ironic part of that is Spurl completes the pass to the 40-yard line is later last night as we met with Mike Bloomgren, the head coach of Rice. We Third said, do you know LSU. who Zion Williamson 30 is? 30-second timeout. And he scratched his head for a second. He goes, 
Yeah, he's that kid at Duke, right? Yeah. And it, I think my eyes almost popped out of my head because we had just come to the conclusion that at this point in the season, college football coaches don't have time to be following who the top recruits are in college basketball and how they're playing. Because if you flip-flop that, right. do you think the top college basketball coaches would know who the top freshmen in college football are at the end of August? No. <laughs> Not necessarily. Maybe maybe the ones on their actual school's football team, but, you know, going over to Coach Bloomgren, I went down there and talked to him, you know, during pregame. You know, the music's going. And the one thing that I remember him telling us yesterday was that he said he's so much cooler, Coach Bloomgren over at Rice. He's so much cooler now because he understands Instagram, Snapchat. He said he's he understands the millennials, his young players, so he feels cool. So he knows what's trending around the world. He said it's all because of his players. LSU using its final timeout inside of a minute to go before the half. They took the ball to start the game. Wanted to be as aggressive as possible today. Justin Jefferson haven't called his name in a while since a drop early in the game and he gets into the action as the clock runs under 30 seconds now. The Owls dial up the pressure. They don't get to Burrow. He throws to the end zone. Diving grab. Touchdown LSU as Justin Jefferson redeems himself. Justin Jefferson redeems himself and makes up for it, and it starts with the protection. Joe Burrow had a great time to throw the football, a lot of time. And Jefferson reached out, grabbed that football. At first look, seems to me he has both hands underneath it. Field of touchdown is under further review. Yeah, Kirk, I think yeah. that ball may have slipped out. <laughs> that was the first thing. I wanted to just see another look of that one. It looked to be at first, when you're watching it in, in live view, Looks like he had both hands underneath the football, but when he goes to the ground, does he, first of all, survive the ground? Does that football move? Treshawn Chamberlain, the freshman linebacker for Rice, is the injured player. Looking at the, se the sequence of replays, yes. from what I saw as he came down to the ground, the ball seems to have slipped loose out from his hands and hit the end zone. Ball does move just a little bit, but here's the look that'll tell you. But does he have both hands underneath? I see both hands underneath, and I see the nose of that ball looks to be touching the ground. I don't see the full. He doesn't maintain control, control. all the way through. Correct. He's got to survive the ground yes. in order for that to be a catch and a touchdown, and he does not maintain control. Therefore, he didn't have possession all the way through. I think you hit it right there, Mike. He did not survive the ground, and you see that football still moving in his arms. He's got both hands or both arms underneath, but yet that football sneaks out, and you can see the point of the football touch the ground. And we'll get the After further the review, result. the receiver did not maintain control of the ball when it hit the ground. Therefore, it's an incomplete pass. It's second and 10 at the 33-yard line. That was a catchable football, too, for Justin Jefferson. That's number. That's two touchdowns he's dropped today. Those are ones that, look, Burrow can't throw him any better. And Justin Jefferson dropped two touchdowns. Burrow had space to run. Another ball, this time dropped by Sullivan. Man, LSU has not been able to reel in the passes they'd like tonight. Yeah, case of the drops tonight. They've caught some, but then there's been some balls that have been thrown perfectly by Joe Burrow and his receivers just haven't caught him. He's 17 for 23. All six incompletions have hit the receiver in the hands. Yeah, but the consistency in which you have to play receiver, those passes that are thrown that have been dropped have all could have been big plays. So missed opportunities right now by LSU, by the wide receivers letting Burrow down. Pressure comes, Burrow stands tall, thought about getting rid of it, 
and had nowhere to go with it. LSU's got no timeouts, and that brings the first half to a close. He's got to learn, can't take a sack in those situations. If he doesn't take a sack there, you probably can kick a field goal with Cole Tracy. Still learning, Joe Burrow. Up by 25 after the break, our halftime report with Chris, Emmanuel, and Jim. You're watching ESPN College Football presented by Dr. Pepper. We welcome you back to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the home of the LSU Tigers, up 28 to three over the Rice Owls who have dropped 10 straight since an opening week victory against Prairie View A&M. Heavy underdogs, LSU won the opening toss. They took the ball, wanted to establish dominance early. And they played well so far, but some missed opportunities. Could be more on the scoreboard right now for the Tigers. So Avery Atkins sends it airborne. First and 10 of the 25 for Rice to start the second half. The first half was good for LSU, but not as good as they would have hoped. No, it was all about the drops. I mean, could have been more. Could have been more touchdowns thrown, but it was drops, and everyone had a hand in it. Whether it was Sullivan, it was Jefferson, it was Giles, it was everybody it had a case of the drops. Joe Burrow numbers, they look good, but they could have looked great. They could have looked excellent. Couple receivers not helping out their quarterback. Justin Jefferson with a couple of dropped touchdowns, one in the end zone, one from about 10 yards out, where he almost assuredly would have scored. So Rice in the first half generated all of 59 yards of offense. They wanted to run early. And they want to run to start the second half as well with Aston Walter, the senior running back. They want to continue to run the football, but the reason why, though, Mike, is because they want to shorten the game. They like the way that things ended in the first half. That drive that got them and produced that field goal, that was a confidence-building drive. Now, they ran some wild owl, which is their version of the wildcat, with a running back taking the snap from center. That was what they did to end the first half, and now they're right back to it again with Odoviano taking a snap. He's right to the first down marker at the 35-yard line. You know, taking a look back at the keys to the game earlier, the one thing I wanted Rice is to walk the straight line, and they haven't done that. They haven't converted, but they did do it at the end of the first half. Taking a number, being patient. They've been patient with this running game, and that's what I think is going to help them in the second half if they want to get back. LSU has not done a good job of locating who's at quarterback. The run game got going in that wild owl for Rice, and this second half really is about LSU finishing. Can they finish the deal? They kind of lacked that last week versus Arkansas. How do they handle this second half versus Rice? Stan Cavage, the graduate transfer quarterback from Vanderbilt, gives it up again. Strong run to the perimeter, testing the outside. Jacoby Stevens, the sophomore, taking on a bigger role with some injuries. On the defensive side for LSU, makes the stop after 11 yards. Oh, you get the big freshman, 6'4", 3'11", number 73, Cole Garcia pulling around. That's pretty easy for Aston Walter. You just follow behind the block of 73, and he let a a nice little passageway for Walter to get through. A couple nice little runs to start this half for Rice. Yeah, as you mentioned that, going back to their last drive of the first half, took over six minutes off the clock. They went 12 plays, 42 yards. So they stay with what's been working on this drive and get two. They stayed away from the passing game today not only because of the defense they're facing that's got 16 interceptions this year, but they've turned it over a bunch too. 16 interceptions thrown by Rice this year is the third highest number in FBS. Well, how do you cut that down? You cut it down by running the football, right? You don't put yourself in harm's way, and that's what they're doing. This is a nice little drive. You want to get points out of this drive starting the second half, and so far you got to like what they're doing. As they switch things up at quarterback, 
<laughs> going to Parker Towns and Devin White. He's ready for it. Oh, man. <laughs> you sit back here, you just marvel at number 40. I said it before. Sometimes I just turn the tape on, and all of a sudden, you just see this number 40 just flash. I'm like, oh, that, that's White again. And that time, he locates who the quarterback was. We just talked about quarterbacks locating the quarterback if you're LSU. What the different quarterback for Rice can do. And that time, White recognized who was in that quarterback and was able to go track him down. Stan Cabbage back to throw. In traffic over the middle, White and Divinity both wanted to come away with it. Incomplete. It's fourth and a dozen. Oh, now White's just showing off now. First he showed the speed on the sack, and now he's showing you in pass coverage. He's right there, and he dropped that interception. That, that's, that's an interception for Devin White. He's got to pick, pick that one off. That's one he's probably thinking right now when he watches that on film tomorrow, maybe later tonight. He missed an opportunity there. Fox continues to show off the strong leg. Fair catch for Giles back at the 10. So Joe Burrow so far, 226 yards through the air, which is good news for him after going five straight games with fewer than 200 yards passing. <laughs> and Nick Brosette, 60 yards and a touchdown on 11 carries. So Brosette's a senior. But couldn't we say Joe Burrow is actually technically a senior, fourth, fourth year in college. He's been around, but having a big night as he still has another year of eligibility left come next year. And Brosette starts this drive. Flag comes in as he loses a yard on the play. I think they're going to get Damian Lewis 68 with the hold. The right guard, Damian Lewis, looked to be twisting a guy down there at the point of attack. I think right at the point of attack, I guess where the officials are trying to get the number right now and see what does. Holding number 68 offense, penalties decline. The result of the play is second down. Lundgren de he decided to decline the penalty, take the down, but 68, the right guard, Damian Lewis, the junior, he's got nice position, but watch the hands. When those hands go outside, that's what you're taught as an offensive lineman. Keep the hands inside. You keep them when we call the breastplate. That's that shoulder pad plate inside. When you get those hands outside, they call it every time. That short underneath route has been there all night for Foster Morrill. He drags some defenders with him as he makes the catch, his fifth of the game. So catch-wise, he's the leading <laughs> receiver tonight for LSU. Well, he's been the most sure-handed receiver for Burrow. He's caught all five passes thrown to him. Despite those plaguing drops lingering throughout the first half, a couple big ones for Justin Jefferson with the first down catch. Well, Moreau's already got the touchdown earlier, but he's, to me, been a guy that is really manned in between those hash marks, in between those numbers. And we always say a quarterback's best friend is his tight end. Takes a couple of defenders to terminate the run. George Nyakwal, the safety making the stop on set. 28 to three, the lead for LSU. And this is the point, I think it started in the second quarter really, of backup watch to see exactly what Miles Brennan was going to be doing. Tom had his helmet on earlier. He was warming up. But the lead, not large enough for the LSU coaching staff to go a little bit further down the depth chart just yet at quarterback. Off play action with all sorts of time. Single coverage has been there tonight. A stretch at the goal line. It's a little bit too late for Chase, who steps out of bounds at the two and a half yard line. <laughs> you got to know your ability and know the guy across from your ability. That time, Tyree Thornton, number 18, the redshirt freshman, just doesn't realize the speed of Jamar Chase. He gets right behind him. 
So the wide receiver expressed his four-letter disappointment, but it's number four who brings jubilation for LSU as Brosette has his second touchdown on his senior night. A nice, decisive drive by LSU. They get the football backed up on their own 10-yard line, and they just go. They go 90 yards for a touchdown, and that's what you wanted to see from this offense today. Ed Ogeron said his goal today, not only to win in a decisive fashion, but to play as many players on his roster as possible. Up by 32 here in the third quarter. Backup watch can officially begin. ESPN College Football tonight is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. LSU gets its second touchdown of the night from Nick Brochette to make it 35-3 over their penultimate regular season opponent, the Rice Owls. Our championship drive update is brought to you also by Dr. Pepper. Notre Dame yeah. did not get its first shutout since 2014, but they did look pretty good at Yankee Stadium, taking down Syracuse 36-3. Ian Book coming back into the fold. Syracuse folding under the pressure against the number three team in the country. Yeah, Ian Book handling business. And that Oklahoma State, that stunner, number nine, West Virginia. What does that do for LSU fans and, dare I say it, UCF fans? With West Virginia losing to an unranked Oklahoma State, that's going to push West Virginia down. Does that possibly push UCF up? As well as next week, if West Virginia is able to knock off Oklahoma, that's only going to bode well for the LSU Tigers in their quest to still get into the college football playoff. And Michigan setting up an intriguing finale mm. next week against Ohio State. You mentioned UCF, that game right now over on ABC, the primetime game that kicked off at 8 Eastern. They were down 6 nothing against Cincinnati, and they've come back to score 14 unanswered to go up 14 to 6 with less than six minutes to go before halftime. They score quickly. It happens quickly. So we know UCF, but also LSU. Only two losses on the year. We know that versus Florida. Well, at Florida, and we know the Alabama game. But, you know, what if LSU can get into the college football playoff? We know we, we've been talking about it the last couple of days, Mike. We know there's a way that LSU can get their way into the playoff. Well, you know when anybody makes a math-related joke on Twitter, there's a first down run for Walter, and people send back the picture of the guy with the numbers spinning around his head? Yes. That's what this makes me think of <laughs> when you're trying to think about how LSU can make the playoff. It would take so much yes. for that to happen, to be a two-loss team, which would, not, which would be neither a champion of its own division or of its conference to be in the top four. Yeah, but crazier things have happened. The Ohio State... They beat Michigan, they lose to Northwestern in the Big Ten title game. We saw Oklahoma win today, but West Virginia losing. West Virginia can now play spoiler, which helps out LSU. Crazy things have happened. You just think back to the national championship season of 2007. It took some surprising losses near the end of the season to get there. There's Jacoby Stevens into the backfield for the Tigers. So you never know. You never know. Look, Alabama. Clemson, Notre Dame, if they all went out, that means Georgia will be possibly eliminated because LSU has beat Georgia in the head-to-head. -head. Washington State still has that Apple Cup versus uh, Washington. ...game as well. So th there's room. There's a way. So, yes, I am saying there is a chance. <laughs> if not, though, the bowl possibilities are still good for this year's Tigers team, considering, as we talked about with Coach Ogeron yesterday, what the preseason prognostications were for his club, given how many starters they had lost. Right. The question marks after the season, where you had quarterbacks depart. Joe Burrow wasn't a part of the picture last year. And then you get a grad transfer kicker who helps you win on a walk-off field <laughs> yes. goal. 
against Auburn. They've got a walk on uh, kicker for their kickoffs right. from Auburn Alabama. And Avery Atkins who's been phenomenal this year and it's not kickoffs aren't something you talk about a lot but it's a huge component to the field position game. Third and ten, Stan Kavich has time across the middle, and his most reliable target, Austin Trammell, drops it. Got to have that one, especially right there. A nice throw, first of all, by Stan Kavich. Great protection, but you got to be able to make this catch. There it is, right there. Maybe the umpire shielded him just a little bit, but you got to make that catch. Austin Trammell, he's a young sophomore. But that would have been the positive play that Rice needed. Now they're forced to punt again. Mike Bloomgren said there might be a fake in the cards tonight for Jack Fox, the punter. Haven't seen one yet. His punt lands inside the 10 but breaks the plane of the goal line. So it's a touchback. 6.20 to go. Back in Baton Rouge at Tiger Stadium, it's the SEC on ESPN. Backup watch started after the last LSU touchdown, and it is in full force now up 35 to 3. As the change has taken place at quarterback for LSU, and Miles Brennan, the sophomore, will play for the first time since November 25th of last year against Texas A&M. Yes, yeah, sophomore gunslinger. That's what he was taught. That's what he's been described as when you talk to the offensive coaches, his offensive coordinator, Steve Ensminger, head coach Ed Orgeron. See how many times they put this ball in the air with Miles Brennan now, quarterback. They roll him out on his first throw, and it's incomplete. Had Morrow in the area. So Burrow's night is done. 20 for 28, 307 through the air, and a couple of touchdowns. He had gone five straight without hitting 200 yards, and the former Ohio State Buckeye at 307 has a new career high. Now that's what's something that you want to look to keep continuing to improve on, a career high night, but they're going to need more of those types of games, especially next week against Texas A&M. And off to Lennard Fournette, who goes off to the right side for a couple. So with Brennan in the game, a highly anticipated debut this year. He's played now in seven games counting tonight, all of those last year. And that was just his 25th career pass to open things up on the drive. Back to throw again on third down. Checks it down to the 25-yard line for Fournette again, who's got the first down LSU. You forget sometimes that Miles Brennan was a four-star prospect coming out of high school. Long Beach, Mississippi. Pass was thrown behind Marshall, but he makes the catch to and carry the defender with him. To be honest, he's got a better arm than Joe Burrow. He's got all the skills. He's got all the attributes. Don't forget Tuesday, ESPN, Ooh. the latest reveal of the college football playoff rankings. And a complete breakdown. You'll hear from Rob Mullins, the chairman of the college football playoff committee as well. It's also available on the ESPN app. This wasn't a week where there was a lot of change anticipated, but at the back end, and the result of a UCF game tonight is certainly possible. Yeah, and you want to continue to keep winning. If that's the model now. People remember your, your wins in November and December. You don't want to see the losses. Leonard Fournette's younger brother, Lennard, out across midfield. Short pick up there on the pass from Brennan. Coach O said earlier this week that Brennan had just been battling a minor injury hampering his throwing this year. And so he'll have the ability to redshirt, even though he's playing here with the new rule instituted this year, allowing players to go up to four games of action before losing the ability to redshirt. Needed to be a quick throw, trying to hit the slant, and it's incomplete. Looking for Kirkland. 
I think it's a great point you made and continue to kind of stress that point is that he's still eligible to redshirt. So this still could be a season for Miles Brennan that he doesn't technically lose. He can still come back and still be a redshirt sophomore and have a little more time to continue to grow within this offense. We know Joe Burrow comes back for his second season, his final season of eligibility for LSU. And to have Miles Brennan as his backup possibly for next year in the future of LSU at quarterback, that's a good problem to have if you're Coach O. Zach Von Rosenberg's first punt tonight causes chaos as the flag comes in at the 17-yard line with some contact from Foster Morrow on special teams. Yeah, it looks like catch interference on LSU. They're not allowing the receiver or the, the returner the enough enough room to make that to make that catch. Kick catch interference, number 17 kicking team. The penalty is 15 yards from the spot of the foul. First down. Correction, the foul is on number 82. Number 82. Timeout. Seventeen, eighty-two numbers that are insignificant. The biggest one is 35. That's the lead. 35-3 LSU. ESPN, home of the college football playoff. My college football playoff predictions are, to me, nothing really changes. Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, Michigan, obviously the Georgia, Alabama title game. That may be some movement in there, but Oklahoma, West Virginia. I said it before, West Virginia, they can be spoiler over the next couple weeks, which only helps out UCF and especially LSU. Do you think Nick Saban likes the fact that his team had a close <laughs> game today? Yes. I think you... You go out there, and if you don't have the right mindset on a team in which, look, on paper, they should have, you know, really pushed them around a little bit. But I think it's a learning tool to show you got to show up every single week, and you want to be able to be clicking on all cylinders. It's one thing to play well throughout the season, but you got to be at your best each and every week, especially coming up, you know, with the conference championship game. The last couple weeks, you don't, can't, you can't have any lax moments. Gives a master motivator a few more tools to try and inspire his team heading into the final week of the regular season. It's Devin White on the tackle, taking down Aston Walter. Watching White, watching a guy like Greedy Williams, just because of the lack of passes tonight, right. hasn't been a big factor. It's kind of like having a dessert wine. You know, you only get a little bit. You got to yeah. savor it while it's there, and it's gone before you know it. <laughs> I know what you mean, man. It's it's young players that come into LSU, and they've embraced that. Look, some guys are going to come here and play three seasons and go on to the National Football League. But you get in the third down situations. This is where 29, number 40, Devin White, Greedy Williams, these guys, this is when they shine on third down. Right at the first down marker for Rice on a third and two. Oh, I think they just a little bit short. Decision time now. <laughs> Coach Bloomgren, you get that close. Yeah, I think he's going to go for it. Keep the offense out there. Try to keep building on a drive in which they can get you points. So they're going to load up and go big here. We mentioned their fullback play earlier. And that's what they do. Perhaps a sneak. A handoff with a flag. So they gave it to Austin Walter. The soft sides defense again on LSU. They've been right around that football. They've got to back up a little bit. It's offside defense. It's offside easy call. Offside defense lined up in the neutral zone. Five-yard penalty from the previous spot. First down. You got about four guys right there by the football standing over it. I mean, hands across. 
I mean, that in, the whole entire interior of that defensive line had their hands across the football. Got to know where you're at on the field at all times. I know you're trying to get a beat on the snap, try to get the leverage that you need, try to build a wall. But you got to make sure you're on sides. Jackson Tyner at quarterback with a heave. Incomplete. Tyner, the junior from Edgewood, Texas, throwing just his 20th pass of the year with the senior Terrence Alexander, the grad transfer from Stanford in coverage. Just got to throw it up. Just got to hopefully make a play, get a penalty, 50-50 ball. But again, it's the rush of LSU bearing down on Tyner. Stan Cavage comes back in at quarterback. So that's Stan Cavage, Tyner, Towns, three quarterbacks who have taken snaps tonight, plus Juma Odoviano, the running back. Four different players. False start. Timeout. Rice. It's senior night in Baton Rouge, but a couple guys who LSU fans certainly don't expect to be playing their senior seasons in purple and gold. Top five projected draft picks, Greedy Williams and Devin White. Yeah, Greedy Williams, one of the top prospects at the cornerback position. Top defensive back and Devin White. Reminds me a lot of last year, Roquan Smith. And you see the impact he's had with the Chicago Bears, but two outstanding defensive players LSU has this season underclassmen but I'll tell you this they've got a decision to make and you know coach Orgeron's all for them playing at the next level well the distinction he made is to say when we recruit players at LSU we pretty well know here is divinity gives chase to Walter around the edge that if it's a five-star, four-star player, the odds are the way that we're able to recruit at LSU, given the talent in the surrounding area, in the state of Louisiana, in Texas, in Florida, that the players are not going to be here for right. four years because they're good enough that they're going to spend their three years and go on to the next level. The caveat to that is, he says, I'm all for it if they're going to be a first or second round pick. If you're going to be a late round guy and your career may flounder quickly, don't go. Stay and get better. Otto Viano tests the right side waters, gets maybe a yard. Yeah, and that, that's a decision that, you know, coach, they, they've had that. You know, Coach Aranda as well, defensive coordinator. They've had that discussion with Devin White and Greedy Williams. They know that, look, at the end of the season, you got to sit down and do what's best for you. And it's been some other guys that I thought that have played well defensively. So it's not just... You know, the two guys who we've headlined. Look, last year, LSU had seven players drafted End of the third in the NFL. Quarter. So we know that, look, the crop of talent that Coach Orgeron has here, they just keep on reproducing every single year. Since 07, 18 defensive backs taken in the draft. Most in the country, six first rounders as well. The defense has been stout. The offense has done the rest. They're up by 32 at 15 to play. In the penultimate week of the regular season, it's the SEC on ESPN with Kirk Morrison, Mike Cousins. Thanks for being with us as we've got 15 minutes to play between LSU and Rice. Eight and two LSU, number seven in the latest college football playoff rankings. Rice at one and 10, 0 oh and seven in Conference USA, looking for its first FBS victory. 20 straight losses against FBS teams with their last win in that category September 9th of last season against UTEP. So their 10 straight losses overall right now is the nation's longest losing streak. But they're a young team this yes, year. very young. Of the players they signed coming into this year's freshman class, they have played 14 of the 19 that they signed. So a lot more youth than they ever expected on the field this year for first-year head coach Mike Bloomgren. 
He's got a grad transfer quarterback, Sean Stan Cabbage, backpedaling just to try and get rid of it under pressure the from Devin The quarterback was outside White. the tackle box, and the pass landed beyond the line of scrimmage. There is no foul for intentional grounding. Fourth down. Now fourth and nine. We've been saying keep your eyes out for the trick play all day when they bring on the punt team and Jack Fox. And this is the spot on the field where it could happen. <laughs> We've been waiting for it. We know that Coach Bloomgren has been saying he's got some tricks up his sleeve. Could this be the opportunity? I think we were waiting on it all game. I think this is the time to do it. And still nothing. Nevertheless, great work from the punter. And exactly the opposite from the other 10 guys on the field, not being able to corral that one. So close. So close. That ball is the perfect bounce. As they say, you had one job. But see, the job is you have to remember in that situation, when the ball is punted there, you always plant your feet right before the goal line. And you got to play like a hockey goalie. You know what I mean? You got to move side to side. That time, when you just try to go and fall on the football, that's what happens. Fox, the punter there, one of 10 semifinalists for the Ray Guy Award, top punter in the country. That'll be announced December 6th on ESPN's College Football Awards. 56th time Rice and LSU have played. First time they've met, though, since 1995. Steve Ensminger, now the offensive coordinator here at LSU, played in this series back in 1977, and he had quite a big day. So did the Tigers overall in that game. They'd love to match that scoring total, 77-0, the final score as LSU led by Steve Ensminger, picked up the victory that day. There he is all the way on the right-hand side leading this <laughs> offense. And there was another member of the LSU coaching staff in attendance that day as well for that 1977 Rice-LSU matchup. And it was Coach O. Yeah. <laughs> Look, the connections are there at Ensminger. I said, how'd you do that day? Oh, I just threw a couple touchdowns. <laughs> all right, yeah. Coach. Very humble <laughs> about a pretty good performance. Quarterback of the future, Miles Brennan with a connection downfield. He's got Jefferson inside the 20-yard line. So Brennan getting his first action since after Thanksgiving last year against AM. Gets the big hookup. This is why they're excited about Miles Brennan. The ball's on the left hash. Now watch where the ball goes from the left hash, the arm strength, the quarterback, the, it's the fundamentals. This is why they love Miles Brennan. He's a guy that, to me, they call him a gunslinger for a reason. He could make all the throws, and that one right there was on a rope. Highly rated, coming out of high school, the number four pocket passer quarterback in his class in the ESPN 300. So that 1977 Rice LSU game, young Ed Ogeron is on the sidelines. <laughs> yes. And he said it was just the hugest treat to be able to come here because his family didn't have a regular practice of being able to go to LSU games. It was a privilege. And he said, with the way he grew up, when LSU called and said, we want you to come, you went. Oh, yeah. You grew up in the state of Louisiana. LSU calls. Remember, they used to write a letter, whatever it may be. If they come calling, you were answering and you were going to LSU. Hard run, a lowered shoulder. Gets the Tigers inside the five, and another run by Fournette. I closed my eyes, and that almost looked like his brother, <laughs> Leonard Fournette, <laughs> running back for the Jacksonville Jaguars, a guy who ran with great power and leg drive. Lenard doing the same. He does it again. So he helps increase the scoring gap between the haves and the have-nots in the SEC this week. He's got the big guys up in front. 76, Austin Deculus, the sophomore. 
And that's just a big guy. That's 5'11", 206, coming right at you. Pushing his way into the end zone. It was a run that finished off the drive, but don't overlook that long pass. Brennan from the left, left hash to Jefferson downfield, helping to set up the score. If you have the last name for net and you play for the Tigers, you better bring it. And Lennard does for six. The college football playoff top 25 ranking show Tuesday at 7 on ESPN. A Lenard Fournette touchdown increases LSU's lead to 42-3 over Rice. There is the Tigers with a win will improve to 9-2 on the season before the finale next week against Texas A&M. Earlier, we outlined the numerous things that would need to go right for LSU to be a college football playoff team. Right now, from teams out of the SEC, there are two teams well ahead of them in that race. Number one, Alabama, which survived the Citadel today, and Georgia taking down UMass. So these were the ranks entering today, according to ESPN's FPI. So LSU taking down what is ranked as the 130th team out of 130 yeah. teams doesn't give them a huge bump, but it does keep their hopes alive. Well, it gives them another win in the win column. And that always looks a lot sexier down the stretch. You know, when you can improve your record, you know, nine wins in college football and, and an opportunity next week as well against Texas A&M to push it to 10, you've pretty much done all you can do. You've got to sit back and wait. Odo Viano meets four defenders for a gain of two. And a win against Texas A&M makes it the first 10-win season for the Tigers since 2012. So all in all, considering where they started the year to where they may finish the year, number 25 in the AP poll, as high as number three in the college football playoff rankings, preceding their matchup with Alabama a couple weekends ago. Now here to number seven this week. Well, to me, look, I know Coach O, Talked to him about it yesterday before the season. Do you look at where you were picked before? And he said, yeah, I looked at it. A lot of people had questions about us, but the things that have were kind of negatives have been positives, which is the quarterback and the running back, Brossette. And even if they're not in the college football playoff, the bowl projections are pretty good for them. Could be the Sugar Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, the Peach Bowl. All those possibilities for LSU. Yeah, I think that this year they've uh, definitely overachieved from where people had them picked. And, you know, Joe Burrow, the way that he's played. I mentioned Nick Brosette. The receiver still a young group of wide receivers, and we may see some more today get an opportunity as well. They're still loaded at some positions. And this is the week where it's not the highest level of competition for teams in the SEC. The most up-to-date numbers of SEC teams against non-conference opponents, your running tally for tonight. Yes. Tim and Joe, great crew to our left up here in the booth every week. 343 to 73 wow. is your combined total. An average score of 49 to 10 for SEC teams against non-conference opponents. Uh, that's always going to be a talking point is this week in college football for the SEC schools that continue to play out of conference. Sideline heave, it's D'Angelo Ellis who's had two of the bigger catches tonight for Rice. Nice grab by Ellis, going up making another play, but you know, going back to the catch here, watch Ellis go climb the ladder. Been impressed the way that he's went up and high pointed the football. 5'11", 174, but definitely plays a lot taller than that. Plays like he's about 6'3", 6'4", the way he high points the football. By the way, latest update 
Texas A&M and South Carolina have also just scored. So your running total goes to 357 to 73 in favor of the <laughs> SEC. Well, you're going to continue to see this, though, Mike, I, I believe. And I know we talked about it a little bit before the game today. I know game day had some thoughts on it. But, you know, with the SEC playing an eight-game schedule, they're still going to, always going to have that open date or that weekend in which they can schedule non-conference games at this point in the season where you look around college football and the conferences that are playing nine games are playing conference opponents in games that really matter. Not the case so far with the SEC this week. Stan Cavage on second down, throws incomplete. So what would you rather see? Would you rather see uniformity in conference scheduling or leave it the way it is? Well, I think the nine-game conference schedule uniformly, I think that works. Unless everyone goes to the eight-game schedule like the SEC does, the ACC does as well. The eight-game schedule, it works for them, but I think it's a disadvantage when you look at the Big Ten, the Big 12, Pac-12, is that that extra conference game you know, usually hurts those teams because you got to play one more game against a common opponent where with the SEC, you mentioned that running tally. 73 points by all those teams combined in the non-conference games this week for the SEC. Ellis has it again inside the 30 down to the 25 for a first down. Or what if you just said, hey, no non-conference games in the month of November. <laughs> right. Well, dial up, dial up the strength of schedule, or to say, no FCS opponents. That could be. You could do that. I mean, they got to figure something out, but they've been doing it for for a while, and we know some big matchups that come next week in the SEC. You know, the we know the Iron Bowl next week between Alabama and Auburn, and it's almost like a built-in bye week when you have these matchups, and the SEC has thrived off of it. And, and I don't think these coaches uh, don't want to change it. And that's not to say that you would get rid of rivalry games. Correct. Georgia, Georgia Tech, Clemson, South Carolina. But what if you had to play an in-state opponent? Think about, you know, the Citadel gave Alabama a run for its money for a good portion of the game today. What if it was UAB mm. against Alabama? How interesting <laughs> would that have been? Not only because of the competition in the game, but also the in-state appeal of that game. Yeah, but we know these games are scheduled out four or five years in advance. Well, I always get excited <laughs> when I hear about games that have been scheduled in 2031, yeah. and the freshmen in that game haven't been born yet. <laughs> <laughs> Just released the two-game schedule between School X and School Y. I'm like, what? They've scheduled a home-and-home home for when humans are living on Jupiter. <laughs> It always does make me raise an eyebrow that that's news. Well, I think it is news. Uh, I'm not even sure you can book reservations or flights. Can I schedule my Google Calendar yeah. 18 years in advance? They'll be booking it. You, you can build a hotel by the time that they play. <laughs> but that's part of it, though. And look, you want to continue to not only have the opportunity to schedule hard games or games that are competitive, but at this point in the year, it's always tough for the SEC to escape weeks like this. Odo Viano picks up a couple blocks. He's to the 15-yard line. Fourth and short coming up on what has been a long drive. Started at their 25-yard line. Now 10 plays spanning 60 yards and more than six minutes here for Rice. You just got to keep practicing, keep going, keep playing hard. And that's what Coach Bloomgren told me before the game, that we're going to play. We're going to play to the end. We're going to play to the end. Of, there's triple zeros on that clock. Really understand the environment of where they're at and playing hard. Stan Cabbage to throw. He's got Austin Walter. First down Rice as the drive stays alive with 4.20 to play. The Owls in search of their first touchdown. Yeah, good job by Stan Cavage. Remember the play before or that situation third and short. Look at all the defensive linemen on the ground. Everybody was thinking run, run, run because of the conversion earlier by Rice. But that one was a nice little throw. 
out there to the flat. You don't need to put a lot on it, just enough catch first down. This is a building point. These, these are cut-ups. This is film. This is stuff that, you know, tomorrow when you go in and you show these guys, look, we're playing against one of the top teams in the country, and we're moving the football. Couple blockers lead the way. Aston Walter, his twin Austin, moving the chains on this drive for the outs. Identical twins, both started in the backfield last week against Louisiana Tech. Record setters at Crosby High School in Texas with Aston at quarterback, Austin in the backfield. And they've helped carry this team on this drive. And back to the wild owl again, staying cabbage, the quarterback out at receiver. Odoviano cuts it back, he goes outside, and he's got a Rice touchdown. That sideline gets excited, but watch the patience of Odoviano. This is the patience. Reads the block, fakes like he's going to go outside, cuts it up inside, then gets back outside again. Outstanding run by the true freshman scoring a touchdown here in Death Valley. It's Fox for the extra point. The only owl named to the Conference USA preseason team. Tax it on. 10 on the board for the Owls. 2.55 to go in Death Valley. ESPN College Football is presented by Ice Cold Dr. Pepper, the official drink of Fansville, and in part by Allstate, reminding you that football season is mayhem. Billy Cannon, the 59 Heisman Trophy winner, this tro uh, statue was unveiled back in late September earlier this year. Cannon played with the Oilers, the Raiders, the Chiefs, and was inducted into the National Football Foundation Hall of Fame back in 2008. Passed away earlier this year at the age of 80. Kickoff tumbling toward the sideline, but not enough momentum to carry it out of bounds. So LSU's got 2.50 on the clock. And a 32-point lead. That last Rice score sent some fans over the moon. Owls and Tigers in Death Valley. Direct TV brings us more for your college football thing. UCF went down 6 0 at home against Cincinnati, a top 25 matchup. One of just a couple today, and they're now up 21 6 in the third quarter behind a good effort from Mackenzie Milton. Clemson up 35 6 over Duke. Their defense doing a good job against dual threat quarterback Daniel Jones. A really intriguing matchup there tonight with Trevor Lawrence and Daniel Jones, two of the better quarterbacks in the ACC. Rice jumps offside here on first down. And Lawrence now holds the all-time freshman touchdown defense passing record. Prior to the snap. Five yard penalty, still first down. At Clemson with 21, a couple tonight against Duke. He'd long surpassed Deshaun Watson back in 2014 <laughs> when he threw 14. Yeah, Lawrence is a is a guy that we're going to be talking a lot of as now the games get a little bit bigger. See him in his first ACC championship game. Look out for Tate Provins. First carry of his career, the freshman from Gurley, Alabama. One of the guys that Ed Ogeron, Steve <laughs> Ensminger, really excited to get in the game because of the breakaway speed that he's got. No, not just Ed Ogeron. I mean, people around here, down here in Baton Rouge, they've been waiting to see Tate Provins, the true freshman, get his opportunity. They're excited about what he can bring. And next year, it's going to be a tough competition at running back. They want him to be a little bit more patient. <laughs> he didn't find a hole there, lost a couple of yards. 
Still more college football tonight. Arizona, Washington State take you deep into the night. Maybe the morning on ESPN. And then it's Sports Center with Zubin Mahenti and John Anderson. A breakdown of today's games, how it'll affect the college football playoff rankings. Check in with LeBron and what the Lakers have going on and mm. look at your Warriors. Yes, you said my without Warriors. Staff. Sports Center's after college football. It's on ESPN and the ESPN app, so you can take it with you wherever you go. I do live in Los Angeles. Congratulations. Yes, and the Lakers did lose tonight to Orlando. <laughs> I kept my eye on that, so you know everybody's up in arms about LeBron every time he loses a game. Big night for Timothy Mozgov, huh? <laughs> Those pesky Orlando Magic, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you. So, a buck 15 here. Yeah. 42 10, your likely final score, barring one more add on here from Brennan, Provins, and company. What do you think the reaction will be from Ed Ogeron about the way his team played and, importantly, how they finished today? Well, I, I thought they played well offensively in terms of the quarterback. And I think that's the most important thing is how does Joe Burrow play? How did he play today? And I thought he threw the football well. His receivers didn't help him out for the most part. But I thought he did fantastic. And that's something for them to build on. You know, whether they get into the college football playoff or not, they still have to play what's in front of them. And Coach O talked about the restart. That restart started today and has to go toward next week against Texas A&M. The offense was good. However... Yes. Do you think that given the way that Arkansas was allowed to come back into the game last week, there will be disappointment that Rice yeah. scored a touchdown late in this one? I think it's a different opponent. And the way that they had built this thing up and seeing some guys in some reserve roles for LSU's defense. Last week was versus the starters versus Arkansas. Totally different cast of characters in this second half on defense for LSU. With the victory, LSU is now 9-2. One victory away against Texas A&M from their first 10-win season going back to 2012. And they'll have a chance to finish 6-2 in the SEC. Meanwhile, for Rice, a tough season continues. Year number one for Mike Bloomgren. Coming from Stanford, going to Houston, trying to build things up. A moment of levity with Coach Ogeron. They're now 1-11. and 11. They've dropped 11 straight games. They're 0-7 in Conference USA. One more to finish up the season for them next week as well. 42-10 is your final for LSU. Joe Burrow, 20 for 28. A career high, 307 through the air. And the LSU win. Quick timeout. We'll come back here to Death Valley to wrap things up in just a moment. LSU, a dominant win over the Rice Owls, who have now lost 11 straight, 1-11, and, and LSU improves to 9-2, and two, a 42-10 victory here in the home finale for the 2018 season. Back to wrap things up, my cousins, Kirk Morrison. All in all, LSU yeah. wanted to be dominant from start to yeah. finish. Opening kickoff, they won it, took the ball, ended up with Joe Burrow with a career-high 307 yards and a couple of touchdowns. Yeah, Joe Burrow's best night comes tonight, and it was because he was very decisive in his throws. The way he threw the football today was outstanding. This is what they wanted to see from him. We talked about a lackluster October, but tell you, November, he seems to be like he's back catching his stride like we saw earlier in September. If the Tigers want to get into the playoff, if the Tigers want to continue to keep winning, Joe Burrow has to have nights like this. Now, the unfortunate part for him was a lot of dropped passes in the first half. Right. That was what was beleaguering the <laughs> offense going into halftime. He could have had almost a perfect passing first half, right. if not for a couple of dropped passes. Fortunately for him, his tight end, Foster Morrow, <laughs> was an exceptionally reliable target tonight, caught his first touchdown of the year, and another senior, Nick Brosette, had a nice game on the ground. Well, what would you expect a senior night here at LSU? Brissett, Moreau, two seniors playing in their last game at Death Valley, at the stadium. Like the emotions are kind of going, and this is the way you want to end it. Those two guys you've relied on, seeing them go out this way at LSU on home, this is the way that those guys want to finish. Smiles abound for the Tigers winners on a senior night. So on behalf of our entire crew here in Baton Rouge, my partner Kirk Morrison, I'm Mike Cousins saying thanks for watching and so long.